Hello and welcome to Photographic Connections, the podcast where we create connection to self, nature and others through the art of photography. My name is Kim Grant, the founder of Photographic Connections and your host for this podcast. And today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome David Southern onto the podcast. David is a nature photographer based on the Northumberland coast. We speak about how his background in conservation work has really helped him in understanding the natural world when photographing it, the benefits of walking barefoot in nature, and why he has a very deep connection with the coast. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming David Southern. Hi David, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast this week. It's really nice to chat with you again. Uh, for those who don't know, we spoke about, oh gosh, it might be two or three years ago now for my, for my YouTube channel and I really enjoyed our discussion because you've got a very deep connection with nature and specifically the coast, which we'll be delving into today. But before we do that, I wondered if you could go way back to the beginning and tell a story of what got you into photography in the first place. Well, it does go way back to my early days, really. Um, although I didn't um, have a uh, a grown-up camera till fairly uh, late, um, not until in my twenties, really. But I remember as a child always trying to grab the family camera when there were, there were photographs, um, and and taking mental snapshots of nature actually without a camera itself because uh, we were always out in nature when we were when we were young we were fortunate to have a house that backed onto fields and woodland so we were always out in nature and always very connected with it as well it's beautiful i love there's, a, there's this kind of theme running through this podcast of those that get, end up getting into kind of nature and outdoor photography of having this connection from a, a very very young age so it's lovely to hear that that you also had that and I'm guessing, do you feel that that connection with nature from a young age is what really steered you to then go down the route of wanting to connect with it further through the camera? Yeah, absolutely. Um, to, to sort of go back to to the beginning, really, as I say, you know, as when we were very young, we were always out in nature as kids, which was, and you, you look at that today, and that's actually a privilege to be able to just explore and climb trees and build dens in hay fields and those sorts of things and just just have that real freedom um yeah we were quite lucky but then uh, when i was a teenager um i think there were some defining moments i remember w- watching david attenborough's life on earth which was his one of his first seminal series and, and being really wowed by the imagery and some of the stories behind that and even as a teenager i remember um handing around petitions in school to save the whale and those sorts of things you know so so the connection was goes quite quite a way back and um and then i went to university and studied biology um which was you know absolutely uh, what i wanted to do i thought i wanted to be a biologist but when i graduated there weren't that many opportunities in uh, for environmental work as the not as many as there are today certainly so um, I then went into a different a different field but always kept that connection with nature through through travel and in fact through my professional life as well because I worked for the World Wildlife Fund for nearly 20 years um, and I also had a photography angle in that uh, in my role at um, at, at uh, WWF as well, so that that connection, that thread, runs all the way through. Mm. It's it's beautiful. I love that you were able in the end to to work with with something like the the um, World Wildlife Fund because it allows you obviously to have that connection that you always wanted and almost like that job that you'd always seeked. And I guess during your time um, working in that in that role, there must have been some pretty incredible things that that you witnessed or projects that you were involved with that further deepens your connection to nature yeah absolutely and I was quite I think I've been quite fortunate to um, have traveled quite extensively in the past Um, I travel a lot less now mostly through environmental reasons and I wish to uh, lower my carbon footprint um, as many wildlife photographers I think um, 
are, are moving to these days. But jo when I was at WWF, I, you know, I, I visited projects, turtle hatching projects in Malaysia, which, you know, it's a massive privilege to see baby turtles emerging from from the sand and on a beach at midnight, and going off to into the sea for their for their to, to become adults before they return again to those sites to see humpback whales in the shadow of a rain f Colombian rainforest um southern right whales uh, off the coast of Patagonia and and it was a real privilege to have those sort of wildlife experiences um working for a really uh, fantastic global conservation organization but also in my personal life I always traveled and uh, wanted to connect with nature as well and travel independently as well so you know I've been lucky to go to places like um, Madagascar and and hold mouse mouse lemurs in the in the jungles there and uh, Australia go snorkeling with sharks in Australia and those sort of things so yeah and um, it's been a privilege and and it's it's a shame because a lot of the experiences I've had probably will not be available to future generations and certainly not in the way that I was able to experience them in a fairly raw raw manner you know which we weren't it wasn't really organized it was traveling independently and um, it was an adventure as much as anything um, yeah yeah Gosh, you must have some absolutely incredible stories to, to tell, David. I love that you've had all those opportunities. And it's interesting there that you mentioned uh, that, you know, people are probably not going to have these same opportunities in the same way that you did now. You know, you must have seen a massive change in nature and the environment and the landscape and, of course, the, the wildlife and in the amount of time that you've been interested in, in conservation work. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. You know, and if we begin close to home in the in the UK you know we can see it ourselves uh, where I grew up was on the edge of a village as I say surrounded by um, woodland and and fields um, if I go back to where I was brought up it's just housing estates now I know that we need somewhere to live of course but um, it's a shame that we've not really um, protected the real green spaces that we should do and we see it around the UK as well you know I've seen it in in the last five five years living in Northumberland how how um, it, we with there's a lot more tourism here and there's a lot more people uh, around in those in those wild spaces um, so that, that's even within the UK and uh, I'm sure some of the places that I've seen in the past um, just just aren't aren't there anymore you know some of the some of the jungles in Peru when I lived in Peru for a couple of years and if I went back there now I'm, I'm not sure what I would see um, what I'm sure it certainly wouldn't be the, the same as what it was um, organizations like WWF and other global conservation organizations are doing fantastic work um, and they are having successes and but you know it's a bigger picture and I think there needs to be some fundamental change if we are going to retain our biodiversity um, and, and those wild spaces that are so precious to us that we enjoy so much. Yeah, it's it's scary, isn't it, how quickly things have changed? I mean, even in my lifetime, I've seen so many changes. And yeah, it's it's crazy. It's almost like us humans think we're almost superior in some way to everything else that's going on. And yeah, it's it's difficult to get that balance right, I guess. But equally, there's just been so much exploitation. It's it's a, a tricky subject, isn't it? But there's definitely a lot of good educational tools out there that people can tap into if they want to want to learn more about them or organisations that they can they can get involved with. Um, and of course, now your your work since becoming a photographer, how do you feel you're you're able to bring that knowledge and experience that you've you've had in these experiences into your photography work? Well. Um certainly having a, an, an academic background um, in biology and a, 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 an interest in nature throughout my life um, I, I, th that, I think that's really important if you are going to be a nature photographer I think you have to have a little bit more of a deeper understanding for example I go out on the coast um, 
uh, and visit a local Kittyway colony, which I photographed for a number of years, and um, it was a uh, I did photograph it as a as a project for a whole season. And having a little bit of understanding of how the seabirds breed, where they go in 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 the winter times, what when they are fledging, um, you know, and their behaviours, um, I think helps with capturing imagery um which is a bit more compelling than just a nice aesthetic sharp sort of image with great depth of field you know to, to get those behavioral moments which are difficult you know you have to you have to be aware of of, of what those animals are doing um i think that's really important at the moment i'm working on a on a project photographing uh, seaweed um which might not be that exciting to most people, uh, but it gets me on the margins of the land and as close to the sea without falling in as possible. Um, and and it, it's it's great because in the last 18 months, two years since I've been um, photographing the seaweed, I've, I've got a much more profound understanding of how they change seasonally. People just think it's seaweed is there all year round. But it's not, you know, in the spring, the colours are coming. Um, you know, yesterday I was out photographing a, a species called um, um, thongweed or sea spaghetti, it's called. And and in the winter, the long strands of um, the long um, strands of the seaweed, they, they break off and they leave tiny little circular polyps on the sand, on, on the on the rocks at the lower shore. And that's how they are for most of the year until they until they start growing again in the spring. Now I never knew that until I started to um, to embark on this project of photographing them. You know, in the kelp forests, the way they are and the way they break off in the um, autumn storms and those sorts of things. Yeah, it's it's I bring my knowledge to the photography, but I'm also learning from nature at the same time as well. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I mean, nature can teach us so much, can't it? And we're constantly, I think, when we're in nature, learning so much. There's so much to learn about nature. It's absolutely mind blowing. And it's interesting how you've gone to be so connected, I guess, with the coast specifically. So kind of comparing the coast to other landscapes, what do you think it is about coastal scenes that, that interests you so much? Um, one, it's ever changing. You know, it's changing on a daily basis. We have the tides. Um, we have spring tides, and I, I'm always looking for these different conditions. Um, we, you know, it's seasonally it changes. We've just had a jellyfish bloom um, on the coast here in Northumberland. So for the last month, we've had huge, big um, lion's mane jellyfish stranded on the sand at and, and, and low tide. So this is constant change. So you've got this constant change, this constant fascination. And I think there's also something to do with the fact that you can see to the furthest horizon, you know, and as humans, we always want to explore. We always want to push those boundaries. We always have done. And I, and I think there's something about that, the horizon, the unknown, what's beyond the horizon. I think that has an added fascination, I think, for us, an added attraction as well and this morning we've got um you know, i was down on the coast and we've got an onshore breeze and it was a high tide and i could smell the sea before i could see it and it was you know it's just that lovely immersive um feeling for all the senses the smell the taste of salt in the air when the waves are high um you know the touch of the wood you know i like to photograph in summer uh, in bare feet you know, so you're really tactile, you're really immersed in the elements as well. So I, it, it appeals to all the senses. And I'm sure you can do the same in woodland and, and you know, on the tops of mountains as well. But it's also very accessible as well, especially here in the UK. Mm, yeah, we live in such a great country, don't we? The coastline, there's just so many endless opportunities in different places that, that we can go. I love that you spoke there about the fact that you, you photograph barefoot in the summer because there's something so incredible about that. I find when I'm at the coastline barefoot, you just you feel much more connected and you feel, there, I mean, I don't know if you've looked into it. There's a lot of science around walking around barefoot as well and, and the amazing benefits that can give us from a well-being perspective. So I love that you bring that into your photography. And I'm guessing, 
do you find that really helps you to connect even further? I know it's engaging all your senses, but do you feel like it, like photographing barefoot at the coast, it really helps with that that connection, feeling the world under your feet? Yeah, absolutely. And 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 you're right. There are many benefits. We we're we're, we're surrounded by, you know, electromagnetic um, signals throughout our lives. So to be grounded is very important. So I think there's that element as well. It it just it it feels healthy as well. You know, there's nothing more than the sensation of the North Sea. You know, um, waves coming in. It's 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 um, what. 10 12 degrees celsius i think even in the summer so it's pretty refreshing but it it does it it really helps me almost look a bit further and and some early mornings when i'm out and the light's right and the tide is high and i'm the only one there and i'm barefoot on the beach just me and my camera and the seabirds it's it is it's, it's really immersive and that's a that's i think that's good for your mental health it's also almost a meditative experience as well Oh, that's beautiful, David. And you said that it really helps you to look deeper and, and see more, which of course it, it does because you are you need to be careful where you're walking barefoot. But I love how it's opening up more opportunities to you. And I find it interesting that the majority of your coastal work is very intimate landscapes. So I can totally see how you walking around barefoot can allow you to see more of those intimate scenes. And what do you think it is that draws you specifically into these more intimate photographs rather than the more grand vistas? Um, that that's a really good question, Kim, because I've thought about this, and it, it's not that I don't wish to take those grand vistas, but I think to get something a little more engaging, compelling, perhaps original, um, you know, I think you've got to look a little bit deeper and find something extraordinary in what a lot of people might find the ordinary. Um, and just bring those, try to bring those things out as well. I, I've, I've, I, I love just exploring, you know, the, the camera can be in the bag in some days and it might never come out. And I spend a long time just looking. Um, there's a piece of music in, or, you know, in my mind, um, called, um, uh, gaze consider contemplate, which is a lovely piece of, um, playing gospel singing. And um, gaze, consider, contemplate is a really nice kind of mantra to have when you're out exploring the coastline, just trying to find a, a composition that works, something aesthetic that, that, that moves me and draws me to, you know, to actually take an image of it as well. Some, some colours, some patterns, some shapes, some um, pareidolia, for example, and those sorts of things as well. Just a piece of seaweed, just emerging from the as you can see behind me just just emerging from a rock pool or something um yeah it just it just draws me to try and look that bit deeper um into the landscape a landscape that a lot of people might just walk over and, and not take a second glance at or you know be as i say be looking out to sea and or whatever but i like to look down Mm. it's interesting I'm finding in life I feel like when we get to you know I get us discover ourselves as adults we're almost like going back to that childlike state and there's something very awe-inspiring about the coast you know the seaweed can take on so many different um I guess uh faces movements almost like creatures the same with the rock pools and if I remember correctly last time we spoke there was um some of your pieces that you photographed of some of the the rocks and things you've actually seen kind of faces and creatures within them haven't you yeah and and that's one thing I'm constantly looking for and and they don't happen very often I might add um but when they do they 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 leap out you know, they almost l leap out at me, and I think, how can I frame that? One of my, um, one of my recent compositions, I called Seahorse, and it was a piece of the coast I walk on two or three times every week, I think. And um, one of the things that people probably don't appreciate about a rocky shoreline is it's constantly changing, particularly you know, with this sandstone. Um, 
uh, pavements that we have here in Northumberland as well. You know, some days they can be covered in flotsam and jetsam, shingle, bits of seaweed, and then we might just get a change in, in, in the weather. And for some reason, and I've tried to work out the pattern, I haven't quite worked out the pattern yet, a platform will be totally exposed and, and free of, um, you know, shells and seaweed and sand and stuff. And you'll see, wow, that's fantastic. And this image um, I saw a, f uh, a few months ago called Seahorse, I'd never seen before in five years of walking the coast. And it was there for a day. The following day, it was partially covered again uh, with sand and shingle. And the following day, it was completely covered again. And, and uh, you know, it's amazing it's amazing discovery to see those things. So it's constantly changing, um, which which makes it a delight when I do come across a shape of an animal or a face or something like that. Um, but they're quite rare, I might add. Um, but it's a eureka moment when it happens. It's so exciting, isn't it? I just I love the the forever changeable nature of the coast and the fact that you can walk down the same stretch of beach or rocky shore a year, you know, every single week, like you kind of say, and you, you see something different. It's like a never ending journey of of discovery. And do, do, I'm wondering, like in your process, you know, everybody's photographic process is so different, and people find images in different ways. So for you, because you have such a deep connection specifically to your local coastline, like what what is your process? Do you tune into the environment when you first arrive or or do you kind of get straight in there and find opportunities straight away? How do you go about like finding your image opportunities? Um, well, when I when I do um, visit the coast, I'll probably go to what I would call my hotspots and see if there's any magic. And if it's not magic that day, you know, if the if the light's not great, or um, you know, the rocks are partially covered, or it's just it just looks a bit uninteresting and grey, that doesn't matter. And I'll explore a little bit further. But I I'm, as I say, some days the camera can stay in the bag and it won't come out, and it takes me a time to to get my eye in, as it were, to really get engaged and 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 feel the environment that I'm in and and, and when I get into that mode then I don't want to leave <laughs> you know I just want to stay out as long as I can um, which takes me back earlier to what you said Kim about connecting with our childhood as well <laughs> it was no different from when I was 10 or 11 um, but it does take me a while sort of getting into the groove as it were yeah, it's it's nice to hear that because I think I'm realising in my own work and also through speaking to a number of other photographers that you really have to build a deep, almost like emotional connection to the subject that you're photographing because without that, your images can look a little bit lifeless. Whereas I feel like with your imagery, you can really see the emotional impact that the coastline is having on you and how each individual subject, shape, texture, pattern, colour, you've really kind of really connected with it and thought about how you can photograph it in a way that resembles what I guess your imagination is also feeling. Would that be a kind of correct representation of, of your work? Yes, um, absolutely. Some things I, I have in my mind's eye before. The mind's, the mind's eye is a very, very underused tool, I think. And, you know, it's I like to step back and think what is in the mind's eye. Um, Somebody brought that to my attention many, many years ago and said, what a wonderful thing the mind's eye is. And I'd never thought about it. It was just an expression. It was just a phrase to me before then. I thought, actually, to see something in your mind's eye is very important. And then go out and try and find that, you know, to 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 bring that together um, to in, 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 a, in a camera is 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 you know, uh, one method in which I kind of use. I also, I also have songs, lines from poetry, titles of a film, all sorts of things that I will go and try and sort of find, you know. Um, if you look at some of the titles of my, my, uh, my images, there's a lot of s kind of song titles hidden in there or 
free phrase you know I, I'll, I'll think of an example um, yeah I've got one called Brief Encounter and we all know that's a famous film and I saw this I was walking along the beach and the, the sand was quite low we'd had a couple of winter storms and a couple of feet of sand had, had, had been removed from this section of the beach and a piece of rock had emerged um, that looked like a face and I thought you know that this this sandstone is will be only uncovered for a very short length of time the tide's going to be covering it and then it will probably never appear again and it hasn't it was a brief encounter with that image and and that kind of so i had the title and then the image came to me and i've got a few more um at the moment that i that are in my mind um and, and those images will come to me because the title is almost already there that's so beautiful it's like you're kind of pre almost putting out there into the world you know this is kind of what i'm hoping to to find and it's almost like like you say putting that into your mind's eye and being consciously aware of it you can go out and and find it in in the landscape and it's funny i spoke to somebody recently and they were kind of saying there's no such thing really as originality because everything we create has come from a number of other things that we've been inspired by and that we kind of put that all together in our own little way and create something based on all these things that we've seen, heard, read, watched elsewhere. And I love that you speak there about the music, about the films, and it's almost like you're bringing all of your interests together into your photographic work, which again, I guess, again, almost connects with the inner child as well, doesn't it? It's like bringing all of these almost play, fun, hobby things together and imagination together to create these beautiful emotive images. Yeah, and I, I don't, I don't, I don't see any point in compartmentalizing them as well. You know, they're all part of who I am. You know, my, my taste in, my taste in music, my taste in photography, the, the things, that, the films I watch, for example. You know, it's all part of me. And if I'm going to express that through my photography, I can't, I can't not include them in in a way. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. It does. I think we, I don't know, I, I find maybe some people try to, to compartmentalise that. But actually, I think to fully embody who you are, if you view photography from a more creative standpoint, you have to bring in your whole being, don't you? And all your interests and everything together to, to really showcase who you are, I guess, through your imagery. And um, speaking about that, I guess, when it comes to editing photographs, how much time do you put into into um, you know editing your images to make them look the way that you want them to? Um, I not a lot. Um, I sometimes will have captured an image, and it will need some work in terms of darkening and lightening. Um, of vignetting to, to draw out what I'm trying to express uh, because not everyone will see what I've I've I, I appreciate not everyone will see what I've seen in the image until I make it shall I say slightly more obvious to draw that out so my editing is really just trying to draw out what is already within the image as well and to add a little bit more interest, you know, sometimes the rock can be um, fairly dull in terms of colour. So if I enhance anything, it might be to bring some of the colour, not really bring out colour through saturation, more through contrast and and the colour temperature. You know, I, I, I love blue. I'm drawn to the colour blue. Um, and and obviously I'll set the white balance um, quite often towards the cooler end of the scale as well. Um, but I don't I don't I spend quite a long time looking at my images on the computer, but I don't spend a long time editing them. Um, I never put things in that weren't in, and I never take things out that. Um, were in the original capture, apart from tidying up some, you know, my, my lenses are pretty filthy most of the time because I'm out close to the sea. So, you know, I, I kind of tidy a few things up, but yeah, most of it is what you see is 
what what you get literally uh, when I'm capturing the image. I also have the discipline of try. I try to sometimes have a discipline of if I were using slide film again and I'm limited to 36 shots of expensive Velvet or Kodak Chrome or whatever, you know, I have to be economical. And I kind of like to discipline myself to a certain extent like that. Otherwise, you just snap away like a machine gun and hope that something magic will appear when you review them. That I think that really happens when you just snap away um, you know when you've captured something when the magic has happened um, and that's one of the kind of the little methodologies that I try and employ when I'm out shooting as well mm. that's really nice isn't it so it almost goes back to that connection it's like if you can slow down and connect and to take that time to develop that emotional connection to your subject then you naturally will take less images because you've you've taken that time to develop that and then you're more aware I guess of, of how you want to photograph it and then when, of course when it comes to editing I love that you spoke there about how you're very drawn to blue because it's almost like you know editing everybody's got their own process but it's like for you it's like you love blue blue reminds you I guess of the sea of the coast of that cool effect and I guess because you know you mentioned earlier the temperature is often quite chilly at the coast and you're feeling that cold against your feet and stuff as well you're then bringing that into your final images with little tweaks in the editing suite which I think is, is a beautiful way to to view editing I guess yes it's it's as you say quite eloquently it's kind of drawing out that that emotion that um, those sensations I had when I was at the coast but let me just ask you a question if I may um, I was looking at one of your recent um, videos of photographing the forest I think you probably were in the Scottish um, Atlantic rainforest a beautiful f photographic environment one I will return to later in the year uh, and the, you know the greens were really rich and I think you were photographing the flowers with with the ferns and a, a stunning beautiful landscape but I was talking to a photographer recently and they had a, a, a beautiful exhibition up and I said you know nothing you've not got any green and they said to me nobody wants green on their walls do you agree with that because you were and uh, you were fully immersed in this wonderful green lush you know scottish rainforest and it was absolutely stunning to me now i would want that those pictures that you were taking on my walls they were wonderful but what do you think do you think people want green on their walls or not personally i think it's all about personal personal choice for me personally i love green um i think if it's captured in a certain way and like you've got that emotion behind it. Like I've recently moved house and I'm looking to, to get some of my images printed for my living room. And the colour code or kind of scene of my living room is based around green because I've got a lot of indoor plants and stuff like that. So some of those images that I've created over the past sort of four months of being in the woods, getting the light coming through the trees and all that kind of stuff. There's a few of them I'm going to print for my living room. So I think it depends, I guess, it's personal preference isn't it I mean I think in the photography world we speak a lot about blues that calming effect of blues blues are very visually appe appealing color and pleasing color to look at and some people love that more warm or orangey tones and we see that a lot on walls and stuff as well but I think there's something beautiful if you've got a slight color palette on your wall you know like a white wall or a, a light gray wall or something like that if you can put images of greenery up it's natural and I did quite a lot of um, looking into the almost um, the the representation of what colours mean a few months ago. And, you know, green can often bring balance and harmony. So if we have green images in our house, it brings balance and harmony in, into the house. So I think I almost feel there's been a misconception, particularly in the landscape photography world for a long time, that green isn't an interesting colour to photograph. You know, you hear a lot about landscape photographers hating the summer because everything is green. But it's like, what is wrong with that? Green is just, you know, a natural colour. It's in fact, there's more green and browns in the world I, I, and obviously blue as well. But green is a very prominent colour. You know, it's so much of it is in nature. So 
I, I don't know, I almost wonder whether his uh, representation or comment there is just linked to this maybe misconception about, you know, blues and oranges are the most appealing colours in photography um, that we hear about the most, I guess. But I don't know, I love to embrace all seasons. And I think for me personally, I love green at the moment because, you know, there's so much of it around and I want to connect with it. So, yeah, it's difficult to say, but I think it's just, it's a... It's a very um, personal choice, I guess. And there's, I've seen some, Not I've not personally been to them, but I've seen, um, you know, incredible woodland exhibitions being held around the country where, you know, they've obviously got a mix of the autumnal colours as well, but where they have these beautiful, vibrant green images mixed amongst, you know, wooden frames and stuff, and they can look beautiful. So, yeah, that's quite a long-winded answer, but that's my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. I just thought I'd explore it because I I pick up these comments when I talk to people and they're quite wor they're worth exploring and and just on that subject of you know the the verdant forest as well I look forward every spring to going into beach woodland when the new leaves are just forming on the beach trees and you get this beautiful lime green translucent light filtering through beach woodland and beach woodland normally is quite bare in the early spring before you know bluebells and things and and it's it's one of my favorite landscapes to visit at that time of year yeah I, I i love all the seasons and each season there's something in nature worth looking forward to be it autumn be it the spring the, the winter frosts and um, the spring or the or as you say the green um colors of the summer as well which probably leads me back to the seaweed project as well because most people think of seaweed, and, if, and I probably I think if I asked most people what colour seaweed, they'd say brown. I couldn't I couldn't disagree more. I'm guessing you see a lot of well a lot of colours. What sort of colours do you see when you're photographing seaweed? Um, yesterday I was I'd say I was photographing the thongweed, and and so you've got really rich oranges they're almost the fiery tips of the racks as well at the moment which look really good so you have these really rich deep um browny green fronds and on the tips they look um fiery orange and yellow in places as well and i put my camera on a on a um cool temperature setting um to bring out some of the blues in the water that was surrounding these seaweeds and and they just look like almost like flames you know and so all these colors are coming out all the time you know brown is just one of them but there's there's the whole spectrum is there mm. it's interesting isn't it because going back to that almost green uh, sort of feeling and stuff there i think when you look at a whole landscape and it's all green it could look quite bland in an image but th like listen to you speak from there about the seaweed, I've noticed a lot this year when I'm photographing leaves. You know, if you're in the woodland and the light streaming through the canopy and you're zooming into those leaves, it's not just green you're seeing. There's often yellowy tones within that and, a f and different shades of green, of course. And depending on how the light is hitting it, what direction, you know, and you obviously start to see the, the veins of the leaf and to me there's some be so many beautiful opportunities in that and I guess maybe you and I I think now I used to do a lot of kind of traditional landscape work but I'm definitely moving away from that now and I'm photographing more of the intimate scenes and at the moment it's mostly in the woodlands but I guess because both of us look more at these more intricate details we notice the awe and the wonder and the beauty in them rather than you know combining that whole landscape where I think maybe colour representation sometimes is a little bit more um, I don't know, um, it's just not quite, it doesn't have the same maybe awe and wonder as when you're photographing those intricate things. Like with your rock images, you see, you know, when you've got that textures and that tiny grains of sand, there's so many colours within that that you don't notice unless you stop and really look at it. Exactly. I was um, walking along a beach the other day and uh, the, the sand was covered in little fragments of shells and I had, I had the, I had the, the title of an image fragment in my mind anyway, um, about how we fragmented the, the nature in the sea, if you like, through over exploitation, and I looked down closely with my macro lens, you know, these fragments, and they were just absolutely wonderful shapes, 
with a whole different colours of blues and greens and oranges and, and yellows. Um, and it's the sort of thing most people just walk over, you know, and they never look down look closely. So it is this magic that you see once you start looking closer. And as I say, there's a whole the whole spectrum of colour there and shape and form and pattern and all those sorts of things and 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 and, and you just the more the more you the more you look the more you see the more you see the more you will understand mm. i always kind of one of the little mantras i probably have when i'm out <laughs> walking on the coast that's beautiful that's so beautiful and it really allows you to open your eyes and your heart and your mind to all the incredible opportunities out there it's yeah it's amazing and i think as long as we're doing photography for us and we're putting that emotion into things i think anything any color any location any subject can be incredibly beautiful if we've got that emotion behind that image which i also think is such a, a beautiful way i think for us to to develop our photography and and speaking about that um i think it was about a year ago or so you you created a book called shoreline which was a a visual representation and collection of a number of your images so how was that process of creating that book um the 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 process was a really enjoyable one um and it was self-edited self-published um curated by myself and um uh i enjoyed putting it together um it was a limited edition there's a i have a couple of dozen copies left but i'm sure um they will uh fly out the door following our chat this morning <laughs> yeah well, so. well you never know fingers yeah. crossed david <laughs> but i really enjoy it and i look back on that book and i and i'm pleased to say i can say to myself actually i wouldn't have done anything different at that time you know i've taken some nice images since that would be included if i were redoing it but they weren't taken at the time so that wasn't possible of course but i look back at that and i think the things i've written in there I'm quite happy with the way they've written. Um, I'm quite happy with the way I've put the book together, and it was uh, it was a really enjoyable experience. You know, it's it's a kind of a almost a legacy thing, if you like. And I think images look so much better printed, either in a book or on a wall. I think that's where they have their most impact, um, rather on a rather than on a screen. Certainly not necessarily in social media. Um, they, you know, you can look a lot deeper into an image that's on a wall or on the page of a book. I think, and that's for me was was the real value in putting in putting the book together. Mm. It must be such an an interesting and uh, just an incredible experience. It's something I've been thinking about doing myself. But you know, there's so many different ways to do it, isn't there? And it's, there's quite a lot of work involved behind the scenes as well. But it's definitely something that I've I've always wanted to to produce a book. So, yeah, hopefully one day I'll I'll find the the right image uh, portfolio bundle to to put together with the right stories to to create that. It's uh, yeah, it's wonderful. So I think I think the important thing was um, I I knew I was going to do a book, but it came to a point where I looked at the images um, that I'd started to put together in a in a folder on my computer and it got to the point where I thought I have a sufficient number of images of a quality that I'm happy with that I could put a book together without having to compromise on any images at all I didn't want any filler I want to look back at the book in years time and say I still think that's a good image or you know, I, I think it's a good image, whether everyone else does is, is beside the point. But, you know, I want to be able to say that to myself. So it was quite important to, before actually undergoing the, the process of putting it together, um, to say, you know, this is a collection that holds together as a collection and not just a, a best of or a scattergun approach. You know, is it a book? Does it have a kind of a beginning, a middle and an end? And does it hold together well? And they were sort of some early decision points. Mm, 
that's good advice and, and thought process there, David. Thank you for, for sharing that. Because you definitely want that cohesive body of work, don't you? You don't just want some random images that don't quite work in with the theme or, or the story. So, yeah, that's that's very, very true. So brilliant. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute joy to, to reconnect with you. And uh, there's some incredible, I think, inspiration and nuggets of wisdom you've shared today, which the listeners will will find great inspiration from. And for those who aren't aware of, of you and your work already and have resonated with your story, uh, where can people go to, to find you? Um, I'm not going to advertise my website at the moment because it's going to be completely um, uh, redeveloped o over the coming months. But maybe my Instagram grid is a good representation of my work, which is dsouthern18. Um, it doesn't fall off the tongue, I know, but that's the one I've I'm, I've got. Um, Decent eighteen, my Instagram account, which is probably the best place I think to see good representation of my work. If you do want to go into my website, that's where you can buy the book. Uh, that's um, southernphotography.co.uk. Um, as I say, that's that's uh, where Shoreline is is for sale. Been lovely speaking to you. Um, as it was the last time and uh, good luck with the um, with the YouTube channel. Oh, thank you, David. Very much appreciated. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this week's podcast. It really does mean the world to me. And now that this podcast has come to an end, there's only one thing left for you to do. It's time to pick up your camera and head outdoors. There's so many incredible photographic opportunities just waiting for you to discover.